it's much faster because you're not dealing in ele electrons moving in and out, you're dealing in mechanics moving in and out. Now, how often do you drive more than 100 miles nonstop? Think of yourselves. Less than 20 times is the answer for more people than not. So if only when you drive the 100 mile plus nonstop drive do you go through a swap station, you're actually getting a better contract. You're going to stop less than 50 times and you're going to stop for less than five minutes. Every time other than that, you'll be coming to your car and be topped off magically. What does that mean? You drive to work for an hour, an hour later your car will be topped off. Now you don't work, go to work for an hour drive for less than an hour at work. Same for dinner, same for movies, same for everything else. You don't go home for less than an hour if it takes you an hour to go home. Why? Because otherwise you'd move where you work and where you live. Part of the social contract. This is a social framework, not a technology framework. When you put it all together, Israel is a $200 million problem. Now, to put it in context, that's the first 8,000 cars. $200 million. We have a battle between our infrastructure team and our marketing team. Who's got bigger budget? Here's another part of the infrastructure that's very interesting. The electrons. Where do you get the electricity? Everybody's asking that question. If all of Israel was converted, by the way, the same applies to the U.S. If all the U.S. would convert from gasoline to electrons, we would need 6% more electricity on the grid. 6%. That's half a percent per year for the next 10 years, which is the time it takes to swap an entire country. If we told you that Israel, if I came on stage here and said Israel committed to add half a percent of clean electricity to its grid every year for the next 10 years, Mike Granoff wouldn't describe me as a visionary. It would be a ho-hum discussion. What's the cost of doing that? The cost of the infrastructure for the entire country plus the clean generation of electrons for the entire country for the next 50 years, because once you put a solar thermal plant or a windmill or any clean generation source, it goes forever pretty much. But the cost of energy for cars and infrastructure for cars, for clean cars, for the entire country, for the next 50 years, is equivalent to the cost of importing crude oil and refining it for one year. One year. Let's reapply that math to the U.S. economy. At today's price, $550 billion a year, just on importing crude oil, into the US. Half of it goes to transportation, add to that refining, and you're looking at a $300 billion bill just for our cars every year. That's before we take into consideration the oil we find in our own ground. The US economy cannot afford to stay at that kind of price. It has to build a virtual oil field. See, what we've done is we're putting clean generation of electrons, converting power from the sun into electrons. We transmit it on the grid, we put it in batteries, and we drive with those cars. And if you add the entire picture with good software in the middle, you get a virtual oil field. If Israel has a virtual oil field, it has a distinctive economic, geopolitical, and strategic advantage. Press a button on that grid, and those cars feed back into the electric grid the electrons they have in case of emergency. It's a distributed, uninterrupted power supply for the entire country. This whole thing happens in Israel. I got one minute. So the whole thing happens in Israel. We start this year in 08 with tests, with cars. Next year there will be hundreds of cars already going for fleets tested on the road. 2010 we have production cars that are coming from Renault Nissan. 2011 supply meets demand. There is another interesting element, which is the entire business model. I won't even get into it, but think of it like a mobile company. Only instead of talking on this mobile, you're driving this mobile. And if you commit for a long enough period of time, for Israel that is six years, at the price of gasoline today, you get a free car, a free electric vehicle. And when you get free electric vehicles, you don't need to worry about demand. You only need to worry about supply. Hence, we can buy as many cars as they can make. This entire framework is now being 
repeated, and we've been in discussions with 30 countries around the world to do exactly the same thing. Policy, car maker, new company, network, and put it all in the ground. In the last six weeks, we've been in 30 countries around the world. My mileage, I, I have so many sins to pay on my climate bill right now that we hope that this works really fast. We think it applies to every country. We think it applies to the U.S. actually faster than most people believe. Main reason is, in the U.S., most people have two cars. You can get one car, the one you use the most, to be a clean car, and you keep the other car for the time you want to drive on that road trip with your five buddies who just stepped into the car on that corner of the street. Keep that on the gasoline car until you figure out that every 50 miles you drove, there was a switch station. And you kind of feel stupid you took the gasoline car. We think it's possible. We think it's fairly quick. And if my predictions are right, by 2020, there will be less gasoline-based cars sold than electric vehicles. And at that point, we got rid of our addiction to oil. Thank you very much. Paul Shai, what we're going to we're going to do is take questions in batches of three, uh, and uh, we'll hopefully have two or three batches of three questions. And we've got uh, our roving mics. And please, when you uh, ra when you get to ask a question, identify yourself and ask away. And uh, Shai, thanks. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Paula Stern. Um, I have a question and a comment. Uh, the, the question is um, uh, r related to the oil price today, and in a certain sense, this is a wonderful moment for you because you've got people's attention because of this oil price. Um, from a point of view of the United States, at least, in policy, what do we do in the meantime to keep that uh, interest high if, God willing, uh, the price of oil that the OPEC countries are dictating starts to, to drop. Um, so uh, I guess I'm, I'm interested in what your policy prescript, prescriptive is for the United States um, uh, in, uh, in that period that you're going to try to fill. And my other comment is on uh, the, the, the fact that the oil prices are so high right now, uh, people are starting to understand what the implications are for poverty and food prices and uh, much uh, broader implications as well, which, this is a comment, which also should be able to uh, help you in your sales pitches in, in a lot of these other countries as well. Uh, Mahi Reddy, uh, Sema Connect. Um, my question is, uh, what is your take on plug-in hybrids? It seems that a lot of car companies see uh, plug-in hybrids as, in effect, uh, the bridge between, uh, you know, pure gasoline to pure electric, and, and it'll, you know, they're placing very large bets on that, whereas you seem to, you know, be a purist in, in that sense. And so what, what is your take on that? I'm, I'm a pragmatist, but I'll... Hi, my name is Jared Duvall. I'm with Eco America, and I have a question about the United States specifically. Um, in terms of global warming and addressing that problem and the emissions, as I'm sure you know, that the, the kind of benefit of running on electric cars is, is really only uh, there if it's from clean power, renewable power instead of coal power. How are you going to make sure that if this happens in the United States, that the electricity generation is coming from clean sources instead of a bunch of electric cars running on coal? Uh, 